The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, seeing of His love. The last forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Up next is a one-minute video entitled, quote, Family Matters, unquote. Here, as is so often the case, he gets us, targets our emotions by inserting multiple video clips and photographs of supposed family members arguing, fighting, and disagreeing, complete with, as usual, tears and suffering. We are reminded that people have their own opinions, character values, and differences. People have vested interests and want to be quote-unquote right. As a result, our emotions are rekindled by remembering the memories of broken relationships, alienation, and disinheritance. When the video ends and all the unpleasant recollections have come flooding back, we are told, quote, Jesus disagreed with loved ones, but he didn't disown them, unquote. So in this case, a historical error is supposed to motivate us all to get along with everyone, no matter how wrong or in error they may be. Well, let's survey actual scripture just to see. In Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, Jesus himself says the following, quote, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Unquote. To be clear, Jesus is saying that if you are truly a follower of Christ, 
i.e. a Christian, then you must prioritize. Jesus, God, and the Bible must be my first priority, and they must be the ultimate authority in my life for truth and reality. If I prioritize earthly relationships of family and friends with their feelings and whims and wishes and opinions over the clear revelation of God in his word in context, then by definition I have placed God as second and I cannot be a follower or disciple of Christ. There must ultimately be a choice. It's not about me because I must be willing to give up priority on my own opinions, feelings, wishes, for the sovereign will of God in my life and His glory. How about Luke chapter 8 verse 21 and Matthew chapter 12 verses 24 through 50? Here, Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, at which point some who were aware of this told Jesus, saying, quote, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. Unquote. So, what happened? Did Jesus fire up the He Gets Us video, uh, quote unquote, Family Matters, and watch it to get his mind right? Uh, no. Uh, did he rush outside to make a point on making his family feel important and not causing dissent? Uh, no. Did he blow trumpets, roll out the red carpet, and invite everyone inside immediately to prevent stress? Uh, no. Okay. How did he reaffirm he gets us values? Well, Jesus said, quote, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it, unquote. What? In other words, Jesus said that it is not those who are his biological brothers and sisters and family which qualify as his quote-unquote family? Jesus' family are in fact those who hear the word of God and do it? Well, well, this means that Jesus' family are those limited to people who have a living, abiding relationship with him via faith. The fact that the issue of God, the Bible, and Jesus will bring disharmony in families is no more evident than in Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 39. Quote, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay, well, what about Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, where Jesus speaking says, quote, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity." Unquote. So 
here is a clear example where Jesus is telling people not only are they disowned, but Jesus never knew them. This means that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter that you believe that you are a Christian or that you call Jesus Lord. What matters is whether Jesus knows you. What matters is whether or not, in fact, you have a relationship with Jesus by faith through grace. If you don't, Jesus, who is God, does not know you. He does not have a relationship with you, and as a result, you will be cast into the lake of fire because of your sin, separation, and rebellion against him. So, let's be clear. We should all endeavor, particularly if we are a Christian, to get along with family and friends. There is no need, and it is actually unbiblical, to cut people off simply because you cannot agree on whether smooth or crunchy peanut butter is the best. There are thousands of subjects which we can and should agree to disagree about and at the same time remain family and friends. But when people's behavior and or lifestyle demonstrates ongoing, unrepentant sin and rebellion against the clearly revealed word of God, we can, should, and must take a stand for God first and foremost above all other considerations. You see, the Bible makes it clear that our first and primary responsibility as followers of Christ is to submit to and glorify God in every aspect of our life. Accordingly, second to our own relationship and sanctification to the image of Christ, we are witnesses to the entire world, including our family, to bring them to Christ and to encourage them in their sanctification, provided that we can sincerely do this and honor Christ, we can and often do show patience and long-suffering with their sin, just as God does with ours. But there is a general qualifying or disqualifying factor for Christian fellowship with sinners. The general rule is this. Whether we are talking about family or strangers, as Christians we are commanded to be salt and light. It is our job to encourage and confront those in sin with their sin and with the opportunity for repentance, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Provided that someone shows interest, demonstrates an aversion to their sin, desires change, or is otherwise open to God's calling, we should remain faithful to maintain an appropriate relationship with that individual in order to further their salvation. On the other hand, when it becomes abundantly clear that an individual is hostile to God, His Word, and or Christ, or that despite their claims that they that their repeated behavior of unrepentant sin and rebellion denies Christ and shames his name, then we can and should break fellowship with that individual regardless of our relationship to them. Jesus himself set the pattern by commandment for abandoning people who rebel against the gospel message and or Christianity in Matthew chapter 10 verse 14 Mark chapter 6 verse 11 and Luke chapter 9 verse 5 quote, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when ye depart thence shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. End quote. So no, we are not obligated to engage in fellowship or relationship with family members, friends, or the general public 
simply because we are related to them or they are quote-unquote family or because the social situation dictates that two people should gather together for whatever reason. We are not indebted to endure criticism, negativity, insults, profanity, or other mistreatment as the price of being family or maintaining appearances or making others feel good or photo ops. Jesus never suggested or commanded that we should tolerate abuse simply to be considered a good person. Abuse, suffering, and tribulation are part of the Christian walk, and we should not kid ourselves about expecting them. But the only time we should volunteer or allow for tribulation, suffering, and abuse is when we see biblical evidence of salvation or God's kingdom is being directly furthered as a result. In conclusion, what did these three videos from He Gets Us teach about Jesus? Did we learn that Jesus was God? No. Did we learn that Jesus was the Messiah? No. Did we learn that Jesus came to deliver mankind from the universal condition of sin? No. What did we learn? We learned that Jesus was supposedly a quote-unquote refugee, and that on this basis we should pave a six-lane highway in every direction for everyone and anyone to come to our country without question or process so that we don't make the same mistake of persecuting Jesus. We learned that we need to dismantle or reform our entire current justice system which is bent on using the same prejudices to victimize people today as they did to Jesus in his day and replace it with blanket undefined quote-unquote radical love and quote-unquote forgiveness of everyone even when they don't request it. Lastly, we learned that Despite Jesus' supposedly enduring regular abuse from his family member, Lastly, we learn that despite Jesus supposedly enduring regular abuse from his family members, he hung out with them and never, ever cut anyone off or disassociated from them. Consequently, all of us are supposed to continue fellowshipping at, with and gathering together with family or friends, despite how shamefully or disrespectfully they continue to treat us, or more importantly, or more importantly, how they treat God. But in each case, when weighed against the Bible in context, we learn that Jesus is not a refugee, he's God. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not a political pawn. We learn that according to the Bible, Jesus is not forgiving everyone universally, including the devil and those who deny him as Lord. Jesus is forgiving those who are his sons and daughters through adoption. Finally, we learn that the ultimate truth and reality are dictated by God according to his word in context. These truths and realities are not ours to negotiate, deny, or argue. If others find it necessary to withhold or destroy relationships because we refuse to deny or ignore the truth, then that is their responsibility, not ours. As for the sincere Christian, we will serve Christ and the truth which he proclaims from cover to cover, and there is never any need to be embarrassed or ashamed because of it. This concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore yeshua at yahoo.com. That's p-a-s-t-o-r underscore y-e-s-h-u-a at yahoo.com. Trust in him. I will.
trust in.